Most backlogs are waste. He's referring to long-term backlogs, not the stuff you're going to do tomorrow or next week. But he's talking about long-term backlogs like half a year, a year. Estimating backlog items is therefore super waste, right? Because if, you're, if you have a backlog that is like one year into the future, trying to figure out how much something will take to implement that is one year into the future is just, it's not just waste, it's super waste because you might not even start doing those things at all. But then revising backlog estimates is in mentally deranged territory. Right? If you have some items that you, will might, that you might work on one year from now, they're in the backlog and you estimated them like maybe six months ago and, and, and now you're being asked to estimate them again, that's really mentally deranged territory. That's what Paul Clip is trying to say here. There's, there's of course, a lot of sarcasm in this uh, tweet by Paul Clip, but there's also a lot of frustration. He's expressing how frustrating it is to go through a backlog and estimate items that you know for certain will probably never be touched and then having to re-estimate the items because they happen to be in the backlog and they might be touched in the next half a year or one year. That's a little bit of what we are talking about here today. So I'll start by introducing this talk to say that this talk is really a quick trip to the future. We're going to talk about stuff that will feel weird, will feel a bit out there, but this is the future, right? So by being here, you are effectively looking at what software development will look like maybe three, five years from now. I know that today, what is happening today is far, far more advanced than what I could hope for in 2005. And in 2005, I first talked about no estimates. I didn't call it that by then. It was something else. I talked with my manager about it, and he looked at me very seriously, and he said, Vasco, no one will ever believe you. And sometimes that still feels like that. So today we're going to talk about how you can predict the release date of your project without estimating. I'm assuming here that release date of a project is important to you. But if it isn't, then of course, you know, you're in the wrong talk, so to speak. But also on the plus side, you don't need to worry about estimates at all. Not even what I'm going to talk about here today. Why this feels a little bit like working or trying to imagine how the future will look like is exactly because many people in this community, the Agile, community, the software development community, have felt like that before. And being in the past, looking into the future, sometimes feels like this. Uh, this is Sancho Panza and Don Quixote. And these are heroes from a story written by Cervantes, a Spanish writer, many, many years ago. And one of the key features of that story is that Don Quixote, he's really a visionary. And by visionary, I mean he has visions. Not that he knows the future. <laughs> I'm talking about hallucinations and stuff like that. And he looks at a, a windmill and he sees a giant enemy that he must fight. Right? That's where the phrase fighting the windmills comes from. It's this guy here. And sometimes that's how it feels like to be talking about no estimates. Hopefully not here, obviously, but in other conferences. Um, but this is the same, really the same things that people like this have been talking about. So what I'm talking about, this stuff that Kent Beck also talked about, although he didn't call it no estimates, he didn't even relate it to project management or project estimation at all. I'm talking about stuff that Ken Schwaber also talked about when he was developing Scrum and collecting the patterns that later would be called Scrum. I'm also talking about what Taishi Ono was talking about when he developed what is now known as the Toyota production system, probably the most productive 
system of manufacturing in the world today. And of course, I'm also talking about stuff that Deming was talking about in the 60s. Actually, way before that, but 60s are the period of Deming's life that I've studied further. So what I'm trying to say here is that you are now looking at the future, but it's not really the future because these guys were talking about it many years ago. So what we are talking about here is what the future looks like, but should have happened already now. This is what we are going to do, and this is why I call it a quick trip to the future. Uh, I do want to make a statement at the beginning that what I'm talking about here is nothing new. I did not discover this. I'm merely using knowledge that others have developed and putting it together to solve a particular problem, which is to know when we are going to be done with a particular project. Many, many years ago, this was the state of the art of software development. How many of you know what this is? Can you raise your... I'm sorry. <laughs> this is how projects were documented. Actually, this is what a big part of my life was about, drawing these things and then later on generating code. Because one of the things we learned very early on working in waterfall software projects is that it's the architect that has the solution. The rest of us are really just code monkeys. Right? This is a code monkey, a real one, not a, a figurative one. Just pay him bananas, he will actually work for bananas. Um, but the fact is, and perhaps most people, I would say some people at least, don't know about it, most software developers are actually humans. No. <laughs> so, when we were developing software like this, we were really preparing for most software, developments to be, software developers to be like this. But that's not what we have. Thanks to the work of people like Kent Beck, Michael Feathers, Uncle Bob, and countless others who have worked very hard to elevate the profession of programming to a very high level. So today we talk about the craftsmanship movement, or a software carpentry. This is about making sure that everybody understands that developing software is very hard work. It's difficult to do. You really need to work hard to do it properly. It's not something you can just automate by using rational rows and cute UML diagrams, which was what we did in the 90s. And this is only one of the many complete transformations that Agile has brought into our industry. Today, we look at software developers as competent people who have skills that are very hard to acquire. We look at them, actually, at least me, I look up to software developers. I don't look down on them, just like we did in the 90s with the UML diagrams and the code generation models, right? So this is only one of the transformations that the Agile community has brought to the software world. But there are more. Who, how many remember this book, Balancing Agility and Discipline? Not many. OK, good. That's good. That's, that means that the Agile movement is actually working. Barry Beam. Who remembers Barry Beam? No one? You guys are just so much into the future. Barry Beam is the spiral model guy. Barry Beam is like one of the uh, idols of many, many software professionals, right? And he wrote this book. But it, the Agile community totally transformed this. Actually, most people today know that to be an Agile software development team means that you are a lot more disciplined about what you do than before. Software craftsmanship is one example of that, with their, with their deliberate practice ideas, right? This is how the old school understood Agile. But we have changed that view. It's no longer like that. Agile is no longer seen as chaos. 
But there's other signs. This is PMI announcing that they are going to do Agile certification. PMI, for those of you who don't know, is a very highly regarded project management training and certification institution. It's probably the most well-known in the project management community. There are others, but they are probably the most well-known. Just like Scrum Alliance is probably the most well-known certification authority in the Agile community. PMI is talking about Agile. Why? Because it's inevitable. Everybody's doing Agile. So PMI needs to have a statement. They need to say, this is what we mean, we PMI, mean by Agile. And by the way, we can sell you the certification program. Right? So this is another transformation, another example of how Agile software development has transformed the way the software industry is looked at today. And no estimates is, in my opinion, just one of those ways. It just happens to be in the very early stages of the journey to transform the way how we look at project management and how we look at estimation. If you don't know what it is, just Google it. If you have one device, you can connect it to the wireless end. <laughs> but only one. See, I reminded them. But when I talk about uh, no estimates in many places, Twitter, of course, is the most common. I get called an idealist, an extremist, and a chaotic person. This is, by the way, exactly what I was called in 2004 when I was talking about Scrum. So I know that this is coming because I know that this is the beginning of a transformation. And that's why I call this presentation Taking a Look into the Future. But I see no estimates as merely an extension of the Agile ideas. These are two principles that I believe no estimates implements. So the first one, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, and the second, responding to change over following a plan. And I, I want to give you an example of why I think estimates are the opposite of these principles. When you estimate something, you're married to that estimate, whether you like it or not, by the way, right? Because if you give an estimate to somebody who's now above you, like a manager, then you will be held accountable for that estimate. And if you miss it, they will come after you. Because one thing you know, and you learn quite quickly once you start in the industry, is that if something goes wrong, it's not your manager's fault, it's your fault. And estimates are just one of those. If you, may, if you miss the estimate, it's not your manager's fault, it's your fault. And of course, it's your manager's duty to hold you accountable to that. So estimating is just like getting married to a plan, because estimating has a bunch of assumptions behind it. Right? How would you be able to estimate anything if you didn't know what was the design you were going to implement? If you didn't know what technology was going to be used? If you didn't know who was going to do the tasks necessary to complete that work? You couldn't estimate it, because it would be total randomness, right? Assume that something will take 10 days because there's five people working on it, and now there's 10 people working on it, and of course it will take 50 days but you assumed five, so it's your fault, right? So this is why estimates marry you to a plan, because it, they have all of these assumptions behind it, and therefore, of course, this means that you're going to follow the plan, because otherwise your estimates are wrong, and, I, and then you will be held accountable for those mistakes. But the next thing is about discovering what is really important. This phrase is from uh, Wikinomics. Customer value, not control, is the answer in the digital economy. We are producing digital products. Most of us, some of us, might be working on hardware. That includes a digital product, i.e. the software. And the one thing we know is that digital products are made to solve specific problems or a generic set of problems for our customers. But if we don't understand the problem from the customer's point of view, we'll give them a solution that they can't use, right? That's why we have this huge discussion about usability, about perceived bugs versus real bugs. You know, when some people call support and say, hey, this doesn't work. Wait, 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 no, of course it works. You're just holding it wrong. 
right? For those of you who still remember the antenna gate. <laughs> Mandatory reference to Apple products. <laughs> so no estimates is really about focusing on what is valuable to your customer. And that's why we tell you up front that you start working on something that you know is important, and then you ask your customer, is this the solution that matters to you? You don't go on estimating a product or a project or a set of features for a few hours or a few days or a few months, depending on the size of the project, and then deliver it complete to your customer and then be surprised, oh, it doesn't work as I expected, right? No estimates is a different approach. The approach is focusing on what is important to your customer, and because that changes, trying to estimate everything up front is just plain dumb, because the work you're going to do will change. So trying to estimate something you don't know you will need to do, that's not really smart. And finally, I want to kind of give this story. This is um, Christopher Columbus. This is, where, this is an illustration of the famous anecdote where Christopher Columbus is supposedly called by people around the Spanish court as, of course we knew you were going to find the Americas. That was so obvious, right? He was actually trying to go to India, but that's no major feat. If you went that way, you would find land. It was just a question of time. And then he tried to explain how something that may seem obvious after it happens is not obvious at all before it does. So he gave this example. That's where the egg of Columbus story comes from. He asked the servants to bring boiled eggs. And he asked the people around him to, to try to put the egg in an equilibrium position so that the egg wouldn't fall either way. Of course, vertically, not horizontally, because ultimately it will be there, right? Gravity guarantees that. But vertically holding the, the egg, so like, this is the table, this is the egg, I'm holding it, and then when I lift my finger, the egg stays. And everybody was puzzled because no one could do it. Why? Because eggs are round in the bottom, and of course, if they are round, they're not staying there. They're going to roll, right, into the, the center of gravity, which is on the side. So no one could do it. And he picked one of the eggs, and he slightly crushed the back of, or the bottom of the egg, and then the egg stood. And people could then see, oh, that's how you do it. That's so obvious, right? And the same thing happened with the Americas. When people told him it was, no, it was no big fit to find the Americas, of course you would find them. Then he had to explain, no, that's what you think now. But when it was time to get into the boat, you didn't want to go, right? And it's the same thing that he's explaining with the egg. And this is retrospective coherence. Once you do something and you learn how to do it, it becomes obvious. So it's no longer a challenge. And this is what estimate, no estimates is. No estimates is something that if you do it, it becomes so obvious, you will ask yourselves, how come I wasn't doing this before? But before you do it, it will seem impossible. It makes no sense, right? I've always estimated, I've always given a date before we knew what we needed to do. How can I do it without doing that? How can I deliver a project without doing any estimates? And this is one of the core ideas that I want to give you in this presentation, is that you will not learn no estimates by just reading about it. So try it out. Use it in your own work. I'm going to give you four steps. That's how I use it. But of course, as any martial arts uh, practitioner would tell you, this is the real level, meaning that this is the level of someone that has been doing this for a while which doesn't necessarily answer all of your questions. But if you repeatedly follow these rules, you will understand how it works for you in your context. These are the rules. First, select the most important piece of work that you need to do. Typically, if you're doing Scrum, it will be the top of the backlog, the main item that you have at the top of the backlog. That's typically a feature or a set of user stories, but a small amount, let's say one or two iterations. Then you break that work down into risk-neutral chunks. I want to be very clear about what I mean by risk-neutral. 
By risk neutral, I mean that if you totally fail, no one will be bothered by that, right? So if you pick a six month piece of work, and at the end of the six months, you deliver nothing, people will be pissed, and rightly so. That's not a risk neutral chunk of work. But on the other hand, if you pick a couple of hours worth of work, and you fail to deliver that in a couple of hours, you will have learned, and no one will really care that you didn't deliver something a few hours later. Right? They still want something, but they don't care if it takes you another couple of hours. That's not really a big problem. That's what I would call a risk-neutral chunk of work. My experience is that for most companies, around five days is enough. Right? So if you can reduce your work into five days chunks, you're probably very safe. In smaller companies where you need to deliver more often, or in bigger companies where you need to deliver more often, you might need to make that shorter. In bigger companies, you might, might be able to make it a little bit longer, but that's up to you. You need to figure out where, what, what that is, what that threshold is. But the important thing is that you don't estimate, will this take me five days? You actually make it even, you take one more step and you ask, you take the first story out, you ask the team, can we do this by tomorrow? If the team says yes, you keep it, you work on it. If the team says no, you break it down, you break that work further into smaller chunks of work because the team works in much smaller increments than the whole system. Let's assume you have two teams working in the product. So the risk neutral chunk of work might be two teams working for one week, but that's far too large for one team to act on. So one team will make it even shorter, will make smaller chunks. You now develop each piece of work, and then you iterate and refactor. By the way, the most important point in this list is number four. Because the idea behind number four is that your first implementation of a new idea will never be perfect. You will, you will have learned, and you will know how to make it better the next time. If you make these chunks of work small enough, i.e. risk neutral enough, then you can do that. You can iterate and you can refactor. If you spend six months developing something, you can't start all over again after six months. So this is a very important point here. So this is the quick no estimates how-to, only four steps, very easy to follow. If you have questions, I can help you out. But now I'm going to go into another aspect. Now it's where the math comes in. So I'm sorry in advance. Those of you who don't feel to, uh, up to take it, there's some coffee now. I can see the coffee there, so <laughs> that might be helpful. But now I need to talk about a different concept. This is a concept that I got from Deming. It's called uh, statistical process control. And it answers this question. Is the system of development stable? Can you use past data to predict future performance? That's what this question is asking. The system being stable means that if your teams developed five features in the last month, they will probably develop around five features in the next month. If the system were unstable, you could have five features in one month and zero or 25 in the next month. There's a set of rules we follow to check if the system is stable. But that's the idea. You can use past data to predict future performance. And data is the emphasis here. I'll give you an example of what this means. So imagine you are a team, and there's a boss that comes in, and the boss says, nah, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to deliver 10 stories in the next sprint. And this is your team. You have been able to, for the past 21 sprints, deliver between one and four. Between two and three is the most common. And you are here and your boss wants you to deliver this many stories. How, how many of you do you believe that a team that has done this for the past 21 sprints can now deliver 10 stories? How many of you think this is possible? I know you guys have some trick up your sleeve, so do you want to share it? What's the trick? Make it smaller. Make the story smaller, right? That's one. Any other trick, or was it the same? 
redefine the base, right? Work in base 2 instead of base 10. That would also work. <laughs> But the point is that most people would react to this request like this, <laughs> right? It's like, what is this clueless manager asking me for? Right? It's impossible to deliver 10 stories. We've been delivering two, between 2 and 3 and sometimes 4. Once 5, there's no way we can deliver 10. This is a pretty stupid request. What I'm trying to say here is that this is a system that is in control using the SPC terminology, i.e. statistical process control terminology, where the three is the average, two is uh, one sigma down, and four is one sigma up, or one standard deviation up and down. And you can use these numbers to actually project the performance of that team into the future. We'll do that in a second. So we can use data to observe and predict the system throughput. But most importantly, we can also use the same theory, statistical process control theory, to detect changes that affect the system stability, i.e., did we change something in the way we work that now delivers a much higher or much lower throughput? Like, for example, we change the size of the stories. That would change the throughput of the system, not necessarily the value produced, but definitely the number of stories delivered. So I developed these two rules. These are empirical rules based on the statistical process control theory. So these are, there's no, these are magic numbers. Three and five are magic numbers. This is the numbers I use. They might be useful to you, they might not be useful to you. If they are much larger than this, they stop being useful. If they are smaller than this, that means that your variation is smaller. That's fine. But what I mean by this is that you can look at a system, and if the velocity is outside the limits three times in a row, that's the outside limits rule, then you know the system isn't stable. You, don't, you cannot use the past data to predict future performance. The second rule is the run test. If there are five or more points in the sequence, growing up or going down, then you can't predict future performance either. That's what these rules tell you. So if the system fits these rules, you can use past data to predict future performance. Uh, we have a database of about 22 projects. This is just four of them, and all of them follow these two rules. These are totally different projects, by the way. These are small teams, big teams, small companies, large companies, long projects, short projects. This, there's no special characteristic that defines these four projects. And these are other four projects where I apply the same rules and the same rules hold. So actually, I hope that I, by using this, I don't know, boring math, I hope that I can convince you to at least believe that it's possible that you can predict the future performance of a certain amount of teams or people within one team by looking at their past performance. Also, thanks to SPC, you can know when it's no longer possible to predict future performance by using the SPC rules. That's what I'm trying to say here. So finally, I want to look into an example. Uh, we looked into one project. And we tried to figure out, if we, if we use estimations, in this case, estimated story points, or if we just count the number of stories, which is what we, in the no estimates, crowd advocate, which metric is more accurate when you want to predict when the project will be done? This is, by the way, real data from a real project. This was 24 sprints, and we asked the question after, by, by having the data of the first three sprints and then the first five sprints. Why we, we used three and five was because there's this normal reaction to say, okay, the more data you have, the more accurate your prediction will be. Right? Because you have more data, you know more about the system, blah, blah. So we asked this question for both metrics, story points, so estimation, and number of stories. I do want to make, an, the, by the way, the database is, is under this bit.ly, so you can check it out and look at the data yourselves and do your own tests, do your own analysis. The, all of the data is public that I use in these presentations because I believe that's one of the important things we need to do. A lot of the estimate advocates never really publish the data they use to support their claims. I would rather do it the opposite way. I would rather do the claims and publish the data so that you can 
you know, make a different claim, or perhaps improve, perhaps make the system even better. But this is only one project I use as an example, but it's anecdotal evidence. There's 22 projects now, not 21, 23 maybe, at that, uh, under that link. So we looked at the first three sprints, and we looked at the predictive power of story points, i.e., if you take the first three sprints, and you look at the estimated information, so the estimated number of story points delivered in the first three sprints, and you project that into the future, what will happen? The true output of the whole project was 349 and a half, don't ask, story points. They just used half. <laughs> and then the predicted output by using the data in the first three sprints was 418. So if you had used their estimates, based on the delivery that they did, the actual story points delivered in the first three sprints, and you use that to look into the future, you would be wrong by 20%. This, by the way, it's called velocity-based planning by Mike Cohn. 20% wrong, on the wrong side, right? Because you would be 20% late. Not early, late, not a good sign. Well, how did number of stories perform? The true output was 228 stories. The predicted output, using data from the first three sprints, was 220 st stories. The accuracy was 4%. Anyone that has done project estimation, accuracies of 4% are in the realm of fairy tales. No one gets those, right? And it's minus 4%, which means that you would have delivered 4% earlier than expected if you used the data from the first three sprints and you projected the output over the available time you had for the project. So how about five sprints? Did it get better? Did story points beat the no estimates approach of counting stories? It got better, definitely it got better. By the way, 13% is a pretty darn good accuracy for a software project. I'll show you an example of how good that is in a second. Again, same true output, the predicted output, 396, so 13% overrun, meaning that you would have been late 13% of the project length if you had used this metric. How about the number of stories? Did it get better? It didn't get better, but it didn't get worse either. It was minus 4%. This is only one data point. We need more data points. We need more people to publish data on this. But again, 220 stories predicted, 4% deviation, but on the right side, i.e., you would have delivered 4% earlier than what you would have expected. So clearly, the answer is plain. Using number of stories is at least as good as using story points estimates in many projects, or at least in this one. But you can try it in your own projects, because now you have data from the past you have both the story points, if you have been using story points, as well as the number of stories. And you can now look at your project, the current one you are working on, and use the same projection into the future. And you can tell yourselves, is it even possible that we will deliver you know, whatever is the portion of the backlog that you need to deliver? You can do that even without stopping to estimate. So try it out and publish the data, send us the data, that would be very welcome. We will anonymize it, all the data is anonymous, so it's published just as numbers. So there's one more thing I want to talk about. And the one more thing is, obviously, there's a lot of literature about estimation. Actually, it's a pretty old subject in software development. It was one of the reasons why the term software crisis was coined in the 60s, in Germany by, at that time, a British guy, uh, no, a Dutch guy, uh, receiving the sum prize. I can't remember that. I should get that story memorized. Uh, and he was having, in the conference, he was talking about the software crisis. And, and from then on, there's been huge amounts of research into estimation. I mean, a lot of research into estimation. There's been probably a lot more money invested into better methods of estimating. But here's the data, not speculation, data. This is the Standish report uh, in 2004. Some people will say this is crap. That's fine. We can look at other data as well. But 
look at this. 80% of the software projects listed in this study were either late or failed. 80%, 80. <laughs> Do you know what that means? We suck at estimating, that's what that means. <laughs> right? So obviously, what should we do? We should come up with a better method of estimating. But before we go that, into that, the, this is Steve McConnell talking about the same problem, and he makes a claim based on the data that he has that the larger the project, the bigger the problem. So, ah, uh, this is more actionable. Maybe we should have smaller projects, not bigger projects. What is the first rule of no estimates? Select the one thing you need to deliver next. Smaller projects, that's smart. The problem with Steve McConnell is that he goes on to say, but I know how to estimate better. So if you use my method, you'll all be fine. And he uses this data set. Uh, I don't know how many data points there are, but each of those crosses is one project. On the x-axis here, you have the target completion date, i.e. the estimated completion date. And on the y-axis, you have the actual completion date in days, in days here as well. The 45% line is obviously perfect accuracy. It took as much as you expected, 45% line. So a cross near the 45% line is a good, good cross. But now look at these two projects over here. <laughs> they are less than 20 days estimation, and their duration is 230-something and 260-something. The bigger the project, by the way, this is, of course, totally against this statement here. The bigger the project, the more accurate they are. Can you see that? Isn't that funny? So. Actually, it's not such a good idea to have small projects. Anyway, the point here is that one project, one single project, or two in this case, are enough to wipe out all of the accuracy you garnered in all of the other projects. Those two projects could have bankrupt your company, basically. If this were your company, those two projects could have ban bankrupt your company. This is what Nassim Taleb calls a black swan, or two black swans, actually, which is another reason not to estimate, right? This is Steve McConnell telling us, we really suck at estimation. Here's a couple of examples where two projects totally wiped out all of the gains of the other projects being closer, quote unquote, to the estimated date. And he goes on to use this data to suggest another method of estimating. What is that quote? Doing the same over and over again and expecting different results? The local guy who said it, by the way, Albert Einstein. So this is my interpretation of why projects can never be on time according to estimates. And this is a distribution of what I would expect projects to be in terms of on-time record. So late, very late projects, so some projects would be very late, most projects would be somewhat late, and very rarely you would have some projects that would be ahead of schedule. This is so common, by the way. This is just an interpretation. Don't use this as a scientific graph. This is not a scientific graph. But this is, this is so common, and it's so expected. It has two names. The first name is Parkinson's Law. All work expands to, full, to fill the available time, right? If you say something will take 10 days, it will probably take more than 10 days, but it will certainly not take five days. That's Parkinson's law. And the other term we have for this, or, 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 or name we have for this, is student syndrome, right? We've all studied. When did we study for the most important exams? In the weekend before, right? We had a whole year to study, but we studied the weekend before, right? Same thing with projects. So it's, in my view, quite impossible to get projects to be on time according to estimates because of this. And we have some data, even from estimation proponents, that tells us exactly that. But here's some data from a real set of projects from 2000 and, 
2001 to 2003, 17 projects in a waterfall state, not, uh, not time-boxed agile, which is what this company did afterwards, but this was waterfall projects, or they called it rational unified process, but it basically means the same. And you have this uh, uh, light line here that is the percentage delay to the project approval estimate. So we don't even know all of the you know, architectural details, but that's our estimate. And the percentage delay to the requirements complete estimate. The darker line says, we now know the requirements, this is our estimate, and that's how bad they were. And if you look at the line, this is 50, by the way, it's not five, this is 50 here, and here's 250. The average delay for the 17 projects was 62%. Would you bet your company on a process that delivers 62% success rate? Because that's what we are doing when we estimate. We are betting the success of our projects on something that has a terrible terrible record of success. I mean, 62 is not much different from 50, which is like throw the coin in the air. So I've been to the future. I actually know the Earth is round. Believe me. I went up in space and I took a picture. See? It's curved. <laughs> that means the Earth is round. It's not flat. Stop believing that. My final statement or request is, don't believe me, go ahead and do it. You don't even need to stop estimating to try out no estimates. Just count the number of stories. See if your system of development is under control, statistical process control, that is, and check it out. See if you can be more right than the people estimating when the project will be done. Experiment. That's what I hope I was able to convince you to do. Don't believe me. Do it yourselves. Thank you very much.